All right. So, right, we've got the clause. It's time to figure out what we do with it. So let's think this through a little bit more carefully because it's actually, it's kind of different from this. It's no longer a matter of, let, let's talk about what it was doing, which was it was grabbing the clause and just saying, we don't know anything about this clause. We're just gonna scan the whole thing and figure out what state it's in. And its state could be one of three things. It could be satisfied, undetermined, and conflicted. And then if it's undetermined, it could be a substate of critical. And, um, and so we have like, right like this. So there's three main states, but one of them is sort of bifurcated, so there's four states. Here we make a deduction, here we go to learning, here we do nothing, and here we do nothing, right? Um, what we're gonna do instead is gonna deal with the watcher that we're on, right? Our watcher tells us that one of these two literals should match the variable, right? So we have this assigned variable, we have an affected literal. One of these two should be the affected literal, okay? And the affected literal evaluates to false because we looked at, right, we looked at a variable, we grabbed its assignment info, we made a literal out of it. So here, if the variable was true and our affected literal uh, just stopped right there, it was just that, then it would be true when the, when the um, value is true and when the um, variable is assigned false, then the affected literal would be false. But we actually do a flip here, right? We say, take a look at what value we did assign and set the affected literal up to be the opposite. So if the value was assigned true, then negate the literal, so the literal is false. If the value wasn't assigned true, then it must have been assigned false. And so then we don't negate it, and either way, the literal evaluates to false now, right? So the affected literal is a value we have, and we know it's either x1 or x2, the first or second spot in our clause. Either way, it's false. So what we do is figure out which one it is, and then we're going to scan the rest of the clause. If there is an unassigned variable or a true variable anywhere in the clause, then we don't need to worry about it because the clause is okay, right? We'll take one of those things and we'll swap those the unassigned thing or the true thing into the clause and, and put that into the watcher spot, right? So if we scan ahead and we find either an unresolved or a true literal, we will stop there, grab it, and swap it in to the watcher slot on the clause. If all of them are false, right? So if we start here and we start scanning and all of these are false from here to here, then what we're gonna do is go, okay, well, we know whichever one our, whichever one was triggered by the watcher is false. We know all the rest are false. Let's look at the other one. So like say X2 is the one we know just got set false. We know all of these are false. We go, okay, well, look at X1. It's gonna come down to that. Is X1 already assigned or not? Because remember, it's possible that X1 has also already been assigned and it just hasn't reached propagation yet because we don't update the watchers until we reach them in propagation. So it's possible that this is already a conflict and X2 just happened to be the last domino to fall. Or it's possible X1 isn't assigned yet, in which case we can make a deduction, okay? So those are the steps. Step one, figure out which one we have. The way Minisat did it was figure out which one they had and make sure to swap it into this position. So let's do it that way. Um, starting from, let's just, block out all the stuff here. I don't think any of that is useful. These might be good to have, uh, like that might be good to have. I don't think we need this, okay. So yeah, we're just saying, okay. If literals zero equals the affected literal, then we wanna swap fat sat lit literals zero and literals one. So here we're swapping them and swapping the first two spots on the on the literals array doesn't affect our watches at all. Our watches are still correct. And then we want to assert that literals one 
is the affected literal. So it should be the case that one of these two is the affected literal. If it's in slot zero, we swap it into slot one. If it's already in slot one, then that's the other possible case. Either way, once we've run this code, it should be in slot one. Now, once we have that, the next thing we want to do is we know the affected literal must be false. We're going to scan the rest of the clause. Right, so we scan the rest of the clause and what we're looking for is we wanna check the evaluation of each literal. So we have a way to do that here. We grab the variable, we grab the value like this, right? We go, okay, here is our literal. Grab the variable from that. Grab the value from the assignment info. F apply the negation of our literal if necessary. And then if we find a one or a zero, So here we found either a one or a zero. So we could say like if value does not equal negative one, right? Um, there's another way we could put it, but I'll say this for now. So if value, if we find a, if we find a, a literal here that is not um, negative, then we're going to take it, take that literal and swap it in for position one. And so here's where we need to do. Um, we need to do a couple of things. We want to modify our watcher um, iteration like this, next watcher right here and use a next watcher here and then do next watcher. We always grab it preemptively. So we're grabbing our next watcher preemptively like this. That way if we eliminate this watcher from this, um, uh, Right, we're going to eliminate this watcher from this chain potentially, but we'll have the correct next place to go. Um, we need to know what pointer points at the watcher. So initially, that's going to be this spot. Right? And then what we want to do is whenever This is where it gets annoying and difficult. Okay, let me think, let me think. 
I'm going to not try to fit this in too tight here. I'm thinking maybe we want like um, a watcher putter that starts off as the CDCL watchers watcher index and is going to be our main thing to help us through. We're not gonna do it this way. We're gonna to have to check these manually now. Um, all right, we're trying to set up a linked list iteration with the ability to erase the current node and keep going at the same time. Let's see. So we wanna be able to say, here's our current watcher by going CDCL watcher is going to be the dereference of watcher putter, right? So the watcher putter, if we dereference it, tells us what watcher we're actually talking about. In order to erase it, what we're going to have to do is go watcher putter equals watcher next. So that's how an erase would work. And then we're free to stick the watcher somewhere else, right? So this has the watcher putter skipping ahead to the watcher's Next, the problem is while this erases the watcher, how do we increment, right? How do we increment from here now? So the other question is, can we do the increment by doing something like watcher next equals watcher next? If we need to do an erase, we do this. And then when we're done, at the end of the loop, we do watcher putter, no, 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 okay, this is where it gets tricky, okay. So that doesn't work. What we have to do is have like an erase Boolean that we set here and we have to do it at the end. So if we're erasing, then the way we erase is we do this and we increment, right? Uh, here at the same time. If we're not erasing, then watcher putter equals watcher next this way, right? So what's the difference? Here, we're saying actually modify the linked list and watcher putter is now a pointer to a pointer to the watcher, right? It's now a watcher putter pointing to the next watcher. But as we did, we, we sort of incremented our iteration and did the erase in one step. If we're not doing the erase, then instead what we do is we take the pointer, we leave the original data structure and we just modify our pointer and we modify it by having it point to the next pointer forward in the chain, right? And that's cool, except we actually want to be able to insert the watcher somewhere else as well. And so then the question becomes, how do we program it so that it knows if it's done its iteration? Like one way or the other, we are going to get to a, part, a position where star watcher putter needs to equal this, right? That's always gonna have to be true. This and this both achieve that. If I dereference watcher putter after this, I get this. If I dereference watcher putter after this, I get this, but they have different effects, right? They have different meanings. However, I can't just use the watcher next and say, use this next. What I could do is say, here's what we can do. Fat sat CDCL watcher watcher next putter equals watcher next, right? So we can just do that. So that'll be our next. And we'll always have that once it's done, watcher next putter goes into the watcher putter. Here we'll do if the watcher has become zero, you can break. Right, so this will never be zero because it's just a part of the array. It's pointing into the array. But when we dereference it, we might get a zero and then we'd be done. Then we say, okay, here's where you'll go next. And that you do there. And then if we want to, we can erase and move the watcher by doing watcher putter equals watcher next. So we can do this and then like SLLQ push um, new watcher 
location watcher, right? So this way we can, or SLL stack push. So this way we can do an erase and transfer the watcher around wherever it needs to go, right? The increment looks like this. This is like our loop iteration, uh, uh, our loop condition. Preemptive iteration. Okay, so that looks good. I think that will work. Okay. And here we'll pull out the watcher clause. We ensure the affected literal is in slot one. We scan the rest of the clause for a non false literal. If we find a non-false literal, then what we're going to do is say, okay, we have um, we have a spot here. Let's swap the literals that you can find at literals one and at lit, right? Um, these two spots need to swap. So now the thing in the watch spot is. Uh, not false. It might be true or it might be undetermined, but it's not false. And then um, and then what we want to do is say, okay, the The other thing we need to do is erase the watcher and from the current list and stick it into a new list. So the new watcher index is going to be, let's just pull the whole, well, it's fine. It's fine. One or lit. 31. We got to fix the literals anyways so that they don't have this problem. But uh, there we go. Right? There's our new watcher index, and we want to erase the current one, the current location. So we erase it by just saying whatever was pointing to me, have it point to whatever was past me. I take me out of the chain. And then you push the watcher onto the new watcher index watch list. And you also have to change the watchers. No, the watchers clause stays the same. 
there's always two watchers per clause. We're not changing which clause this watcher watches. We're changing which literal it's chained onto. Okay, so now if we hit that, we can stop right there. We don't need to scan anywhere farther in. And we also want to, uh, so this is use this literal if find a non-false literal dot 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 you set it up at um, put the watcher on this literal not instead right so we swap that into position and then we put the watcher into the new spot in the chain and we're done we're good to go um, and the clause is not in conflict or uh, in a state of needing a deduction now um, if we get to the end of this and we don't find any of these then things are getting more interesting. But before we can build that part, we need to maybe let's ratchet up the tension a little bit higher here by saying, before we get this far, let's rule out some other things. It's possible that this clause has already been satisfied and that the true literal has been shuffled to the front to keep to help us remember that. And so what we can do is say, uh, evaluate the other watched literal right here and the way we do that is we go okay um fat sat lit the literal we're looking at here is literals zero um we want to do a var from lit and a value from variable and then a negation and if the value is positive then this is already true. So if it's already true, then there's nothing else to do. This clause is fine. It's, um, let's actually do this. Let's evaluate this. Other watch literal, other watch variable, other watch literal. Other watched variable, other watched value, other watched value, other watched literal. Okay. So now if other watched value is true, then this clause is fine. So we're scanning the watchers and we're trying to figure out if we need to do something with this clause. So we want to do something there. If handle the watched clause, S32, or let's call this U32 clause status is going to initially be zero. So if we set the clause status to one, then the clause is fine. If the clause status is still zero, then we'll do this. And if we find one of these, then the clause status can become two, which will mean we know for sure that, I guess we can set it to one, which means we don't need to do any more work. We we'll ignore the rest of like, don't, it means no conflict, no deduction, right? There's no conflict to make, there's no deduction to make, there's no conflict to make, there's no deduction to make. Zero means we don't know what to do yet. No conflict, no deduction, no conflict, no deduction. Um, if we've gotten to this point, right? If we've gotten past this, so we didn't find out that the clause is already satisfied. We didn't find out that there are some free variables that are still loose in this clause. That means this other watched value 
is completely determinative now. So, um, So if the clause status is still zero, so we haven't actually fit, found anything true um, or undetermined yet, and we've looked at so far, we know clause, literals one is gonna be false, and we know that everything past that is false. So the only thing that could possibly be undetermined is this one. So if the other watched value is zero, then our clause, then we have a deduction to make, right? So here, let's look at how we do a deduction. The variable is the other watched variable. The value is gonna be figured out by looking at other watched literal. It tells us that, and then we can assign the other watched variable this value and this clause and now we're good we made a deduction that'll get propagated and handled later but we don't need to do we don't need to worry about anything else but if we've gotten this far okay so there's no need for like a zero one two kind of thing we're gonna go clause is okay If we still don't know that the clause is okay, if we still don't know that the clause is okay, all right. Now, if we get this far, if this clause is in conflict, Then what we are doing is we're saying, okay, the clause is in conflict. How did we handle conflict before? We set the path to fail, we save the conflict clause, we jump out. That should still be good. Okay. All right, so I, I, I'm not 100% confident, but I think that should do the right thing. Um, but this is a complex and subtle data structure and algorithm. So we won't be surprised if, yeah, if there's a mistake in there somewhere. All right, so we are hitting that, that issue. The, um, let's take a look at some stuff. So the, the, let's start with one thing at a time here. What's the affected literal? 171. Um, let's look at things in hexadecimal. So A, B. So that means the watch -er index should be just that shifted up by one, right? If we were to do, yeah. Okay, that all makes sense. So then what is the chain of watchers like at oh, X156? So we have one, two, and then we're done. There's a couple of them, right? So we got one, two good ones. Now let's look at 
the literals. And what is our literal count here? Um, clause literal count. So we're looking for an AB. And there is an AB, but it's not in position zero or one. It's over here in position three. So the question is, how did we end up with that? So let's take a look at this as it's running across more stages. Maybe it's working for a little while and then getting corrupted. All right, so our affected literal is this, eight zeros B4. And so, oh. Aren't, isn't our affected literal, oh, our affected literal, sorry. Our affected literal is eight zeros. So we put eight zeros there. The other watch literal is carrying a value of zero. So, no, we can't just say that that makes the clause true and be done. We scan the rest of the clause. There is no rest of the clause. This clause has two elements. So the clause is still not okay, but the other watched value is indetermined. So this is a, a deduction. We figure out the value we want to give it. We want to give it the value false, and we create an assignment. And now our clause is okay. And we increment our watch pointer up one. All right, so yeah, that gets swapped in place. Again, I think we're just going to figure out, we're just deducing a bunch of, remember with Sudoku, we have a bunch of uh, rules that are like, you can't put a one and a two in the same box. And so if we guess that a one goes in the first box, it is now gonna make a bunch of very easy deductions because the fact that you can't put a one and a two in the same box is, a, is, is encoded in a clause with just two literals. And so as soon as you set one of them to true, all of the connected ones can suddenly be deduced false. So none of these look like problems to me. As long as we're processing this, I bet you it'll be fine. And there's a lot of them because there's nine in the box. There's also nine across the row or eight in the box, eight across the row, eight across the column, and then four more in the, or there's eight in the cell, I should say, eight in the cell, eight in the row, eight in the column. Here we go. Now it just got interesting. Now we are looking at a different affected literal. So we must be at propagation assign index one. We are. And we are gonna grab a different clause. So let's put our um, breakpoint right here so that we're looking at the correct data. Now B4 is in the correct spot right now. So it's gonna to have to look at B4 and go, okay, so we said B4 is the affected literal. Um, so that one we know is false. That one's going to need to go here. We're going to need to figure out what to do with it. Now the other watch value is still zero. So that one is free. So that means we're not about to find a conflict at least. Um, but we can't end yet. We need to scan the lit clause to see if there are any other values that are unfalse. Okay, so this one's unfalse because it's undetermined. So the next one here is not false yet. So we're going to swap those. Good. We're gonna calculate the new watcher index. The new watcher index, which is different from the watcher index, right? No. How did we mess it up? Those should be different. Oh, but we've done the swap. So now I'm using star lit, but star lit points at something different. Okay, that's a mistake. Let's pull it out as a local variable because that's confusing. So. After we do the swap, let's see. We'll just put it right here. Fat, sat, lit. Oh, 
literal equals lit. Here is the literal. Here is the literal. We do the swap, and we want to keep dealing with the literal that we grabbed in the first place, not the thing that we swapped into its spot. All right. Does that fix it? No, still a bug. All right, cool. It's gotten interesting. Two bugs back to back. So here's our first time again. We're back in the same spot. This time we swap. B6 goes there. Now we do get a new watcher index, so that's good. Now the watcher putter, whatever that is pointing to, we want to say like our watcher next gonna look like okay got it so watcher putter is gonna change and so what that should mean is that if I look at the CDCL watchers living on watcher index this should have been modified and it looks like it has been that just got set to zero which makes sense if we are removing something from it and watcher next is empty so the, the watcher we're on doesn't have anything after it so when we remove this one we're done there's nothing else for the watcher for this watcher chain to contain right now it does kind of make me curious how many of our watcher slots are actually used we have um, cdcl variable count times two there are no nulls every one of them has some stuff in it which is cool except we just created one that is empty right here looks like there start being more empty ones later that makes sense because some of the later ones might appear in less clauses although i think every literal every positive literal okay every negative literal will will have an appearance the positive literals um only show up in the large clauses and so they could be the ones that are, you know, these will probably be the even ones. If we were to divide these by eight, um, if we were to divide these offsets by eight, we would find that these are the even slots and these are the odd slots. So that makes sense. The positive ones get the even slots. Okay. So... watcher index 168 went to zero new watcher index 16c is about to get a watcher so it got a watcher and that watcher still points to the same clause but it's now attached to the literal b6 not the literal b4 Clause is okay because we found something undetermined for it to work with. So let's see what happens on the next iteration. Does more happen? Oh, the watcher is empty now. Yeah, we did get to the end of a list. So we're going to propagate farther by going to the next index. The assigned variable gives us. this okay so we have an affected literal of a b that's not the one we were dealing with before okay we get a watcher we get some literals so let's take a look what do we got a b is in this slot so this is still good So are we saying B4 must also be coming out false already? I think so. 
So here we get a value we can use. We swap it into place. Let's take a quick look just because I'm curious. CDCL assign info from var oxb4. Yep, this one is already assigned false. So that makes sense. These are different. So this is going to erase one here and store one here. Cool. And now that clause is okay. We have another watcher on this chain. All right, so we're looking at AB, but hey, now we're at that point where AB isn't actually here. So what happened? AB isn't even in this list at all. So something bad happened. How did we get to the point where that's happening? All right, all right, all right. So we wanna look at that um, in the following way. First, let's put down breakpoints, breakpoint right here. That's the first time it gets a little bit interesting is when that happens. The B4 and B6 swap and we come out and that's the end of that one. Very good. Now we wanna be looking at this spot when the affected literal is AB. And we wanna look at the entire chain we have here. So we have a couple of things. We got this one and we got this one. So these are the two that it says it wants to look at. Let's give ourselves more room here. I have to lose that one for now. So our first clause is this one. And our second clause is this one. It wants to visit these two places. Okay. And then after that, it should be, yeah, it should be good. All right, so you wanna visit these two places. What happens if I look inside here? You've got nine literals. Let's grab you and look at your literals. An expansion of nine there. And let's grab you. Look at your literals with an expansion of nine there. You both contain a B. Okay. So right now you're valid. And the question then is why are we arriving at a clause that's not valid? So maybe my iteration through the watch or pointer thing here isn't working. So just to double check some things, these are the watches that we know we want to reach. Let's clear out everything else. I still want to have my affected literal. We're looking for Uh, let's look at the watcher putter. So that's pointing me at this clause, uh, 167548, good. And it's next is 14F948. Okay, so those still make sense. Now, if we're gonna to come to the point where I'm gonna do an erase right here, now let's see if we can make sense of that. So watcher putter, or let's see, watcher next still points at the right thing. So when I do watcher putter, I get this clause, and then when I go to its next, I get this clause. That makes sense. I'm gonna take this next pointer and write it in here now. So 
So this should still point to something valid. which is this. And watch our next putter. Watch our next putter is not correct. That makes sense. Okay, I get it now. So the problem is my mistake here is that when, look at this, when I first create this, I create a thing pointing to watcher next. I'm gonna move watcher, so a thing pointing to this isn't gonna stay valid. I think instead what I need to do is, what I'm, what I'm trying to achieve is to make sure that the erasing works. I'm gonna just have to say when we do the erasing, we need to update watcher next putter. So watcher next putter by default is set up like this. When we've done, this watcher next putter becomes watcher putter, right? We just say like, okay, the next step is to stay where you're at. We've actually done the iteration already or something like that, right? Or what we could do is say, instead of having a watcher next putter, we can say like did erase or did relocate watcher. And so if you do this stuff here, instead of saying watcher next putter, you say did relocate watcher equals true right there. And so now if you did not relocate watcher, then you are interested in setting the watcher putter to the watcher next. But if you did relocate the watcher, then watcher putter is already in the right spot. Hey, it ran, did it run and give us correct result? It looks like it did. So um, we still don't really expect this. So 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 it looks like that worked, which is cool. Let's let's start with that. Let's start with saying it looks like we can drive propagation from the watchers. It looks like the whole watcher mechanism is working. And so that might be a pretty big victory for today that might be the right place to say we made progress and caught it off um, but before we conclude that for sure and not do anything else um, let's just take a little bit of time to see how if this makes any difference in the performance of the hard problem All right. We don't I don't really expect it to because it still has to do so much guessing and backtracking so that even though we've sped up propagation which is a big time consuming chunk, I think it's the bigger problem is how much pro, how many rounds of back and forth it's actually going to have to do either way. But let's see if we do that and we do release mode here and let's turn on whoops, not that. Let's turn on logging so that we can see um, let's turn on logging so that we can see a little bit of the output. Let's not run it in four coder. All right, so I, it's, it's giving me too much. I want to tell it, and I need to do this in a better way soon. Let's put this on the to-do list. Uh, oh yeah, I have log levels already. We gotta do log levels sooner or later. But let's say, don't give me any of the, um, don't give me any of the deductions, because those there are so many of those. Let's skip it, all right? Now, this number is flying very quickly, but if you can see, it's kind of around the, the teens or early 20s. And
it still has to do things like the learned clauses are still extremely um, massive. So like there's a lot of streamlining of the logic that hasn't occurred here yet. It still has to do a lot of backtracking and guessing over and over and over again, trying to figure out what it can do. And it's still not easy to tell if it's like converging eventually or not. So even though this definitely should speed things up, I don't know if it's um, really gonna make a difference on our hard problem. Because I think a bigger pro issue is still that it needs a better heuristic in order for it to get through. All right, so, but that's not surprising, kind of what I was expecting. So my next question for this is, if that's true, if, it's, if this was a nice uh, way to speed up the propagation process, but there's still too much propagation to do, JVS Tech, this is, uh, just to confirm, this is not Sudoku, correct? Uh, this is Sudoku, but it's not standard Sudoku. It's, it's an enhanced Sudoku. So the rule here, let me show you. The simple version is Sudoku with the extra constraint that um, uh, that there's this thing called a thermometer, which starts here and moves to the right. And so you can see, instead of going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Right, it um, it because if I turn the thermometer here, I'll show you this. If I turn all the thermometers off, that's the board it'll generate. That's it's like the easiest one for it to guess is to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The thermometer constraint tells it that at the beginning of a thermometer is the smallest number, and then it creates a path through the grid. Right, the thermometer is like a path through the grid, and so I encode that right here. Here's my path. I started at the top right corner and I move it left four times, and it tells it these numbers need to be strictly increasing. It doesn't say they should be increasing like incrementally, one, two, three, four, but the this first number should be smaller than the next number. The last number on the thermometer should be bigger than all the previous ones and so on and so on, right? And so when it runs, um, it follows that rule. So we can encode these constraints with SAT and put them uh, into our board and it just does them correctly, which is cool. But then when I give it a real thermo problem, so here's this this set of constraints here is a thermo uh, Sudoku problem that has a single unique solution. It doesn't have any numbers in the grid. It's an empty grid, no digits, but it's got these thermometers that make that constrain it enough to create a unique solution. And that's the one that when we run it, we're getting that it's just it's too big an ask. And it's also way too slow in four coder. We can't even get this up into the teens. When we were running it on the command line, at least it was getting farther, but here it's so slow. So let's see. That's that. Also no to you um also no to you what are you doing awake anyways um point is um this is too difficult for it still and my best understanding of why it's too difficult for it is that it's just doing a bad job of making guesses and it's also doing a bad job of learning clauses and so those two things those are two things we can improve in ways that might help it a lot. I think the biggest thing though is the guesses because um, even if it was learning clauses better, what we would do to make its clause learning better is make them smaller and so a little faster to process, but we would still ultimately end up with the same pattern. Also, why is it still printing deductions? I think I might've turned deductions back on and that's why it was so slow, deduction printing. Anyway, um, so really the, the, the big thing is that the heuristic needs to start getting better and there are some easy ways I could do that. Like let's 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 play one way right now. Right here, um, it makes where is the guess? Where is the guess? Here it is. Okay. So right now it's making a guess by taking the first unassigned assignment a uh, variable and assigning true to it. So it just puts true on something 
And if that isn't the correct thing to do, then it has to learn from that mistake and backtrack it. And it turns out there are just there's that 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 much brute force, even with the CDCL engine, to make deductions and learn clauses. It's still not enough for it to find its way to uh, a solution in a timely manner. So the next question is, how do we make better guesses so that it's it's actually making progress? And one answer is we could just start doing things like these, like priority queue, where we look at which variable assignments would have the highest impact, All right? Like we can look at a bunch of variables and say like, okay, this variable is occurring in a lot of clauses. Let's assign it in such a way that it may, it, that it goes false in more clauses than true. And that's going to cause a bunch of deductions right away. And that's going to maybe learn, lead to a contradiction more easily. And if it does, then we'll learn something. Or if it doesn't, then we just made a good guess right off the bat. Um, right. But this is sort of like when you do a thermo Sudoku yourself, this is a kind of approach you would use. But this is a point of priority queuing um, would just be a generalized heuristic we could use on any problem. Um, we could also go and say like, we want to build a system for user supplied heuristics. So when we go to run the SAT solver, we would plug in heuristics and say, hey, I want you to run this heuristic. This is this is for the thermo Sudoku uh, problem. And then it would be able to do things like, okay, well, why don't we make, make guesses that make a little bit more sense for thermo Sudoku? So it'll be like, all right, well, we know where the thermometers are outside of the SAT solver. Let's have it start by guessing um, things like ones at the beginning of each thermo uh, Sudoku just to get it working on something that has a good chance of, of working out more likely, right? And uh, have it increment from there. So like it's, its first guess would be like, what if we put ones in all of them? Oh, that's a contradiction. What if we put a two in this one? Or, or what if we put, okay, let's, one in this one doesn't work. So the next guess for this slot is two, right? We can build a little data structure that generates guesses for thermo Sudoku that makes sense as you know sort of scanning the most likely space of solutions for this style of problem that's kind of what i'm thinking but in order to get there um i think it would make sense to first build the sort of baseline heuristics that are better because we might want a a, a heuristic system that says like hey does the thermo sudoku heuristic have anything to say and if not fall back to a generic one or something right and so we want to be able to start building and piecing together good heuristics for different different solve problems. Um, there's also the problem, like I said, of simplifying the learned claw the learned clauses as we learn them. And there's the problem of optimizing this for lower level speed ups. Um, and it might also be the case that as soon as I put in like a good generic heuristic like the priority queue stuff or random assignment, that it just gets better. Like we could try random assignment pretty easily right now. So what we would do is say, um, Instead of first unassigned, let's do random as our heuristic. And so now what we do is we go um, fat, sat, these are bars. Today we switched from using U32s to the var for that. Um, guess variable equals. Now let's see, PRNG, PRNG, roll a U32, roll a bounded. Let's put the CDCL PRNG right there. Let's say the bound is the CDCL variable count. We then look inside this to go, okay, is this Well, one downside to this is like, if I have a hundred variables and 90 of them are assigned, this is gonna start going slower and slower to find something unassigned. So another approach I could make to do it randomly is to keep track of which ones are unassigned and generate a variable that's, generate one of them off that set. Or I could count how many of them are unassigned. So here's what we'll do. We'll say unassigned count. 
U32 unassigned count is going to be the CDCL variable count minus the CDCL assigned index OPL. All right. So that's how many are unassigned. And what we want to do is say, once we know our n, we don't need a loop here. This is just going to be straight line um, code. But once we know it, what we're going to do is we're going to loop over all of the variables. And for each one, we're going to look at its assignment info. And if the assign info is telling us that the value is zero, we're going to say, all right, if n equals zero, then this is our guess variable break. Otherwise, we're going to decrement n. So we know that we got an n that is between zero and the unassigned count. Then we're scanning and for each unassigned number or each unassigned variable we find, um, if we've gotten n down to zero, then this is the one we were trying to grab. If it's not down to zero, we decrement and keep going. So it'll definitely hit zero by the last one. And so it'll grab one of them randomly. Um, so it's still doing a loop, but it's doing a loop that is a scan over all the variables once instead of a loop of an unknown number of uh, roles. And then for the guess value, we'll do if um, PRNG roll U32 CDCL PRNG and one, then guess value equals negative one. So we just randomly set it to one or negative one. All right, so there's random. Now in order to make that work, let's drop PRNG right here. Um, so that's good. And Uh, we need to set it up. So when we do CDCL begin, we're going to do PRNG seed, seed, OS get entropy, seed size of seed, CDCL PRNG equals PRNG make, uh, PRNG from seed, uh, init from seed, seed. Is that the right signature for you? Yeah, init from seed. Okay and you don't know about PRNG, that's fine. Fat sat test. Um, throw in the PRNG H, the PRNG C for us, please. There we go. All right, and um, before we do any more of that, let's do uh, let's see, what was I thinking? Before we do run this, let's turn off the thermal constraints completely. So we just have a blank board, but now we're guessing randomly. So we'll no longer get the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine across the board but I wonder if we'll get something still just as fast. Nice, and so this should be a, a valid Sudoku board, but it's now a randomly chosen one. There we go. There we go. All right, so it's just, now the heuristic is RNG, so it's just randomly spitting out um, Sudoku boards, and look, it, how many times is it backtracking? Let's take a look at that as we go. Backtrack once, boom, back, no backtracks, boom, backtrack once, boom, backtrack once. Okay, now here's my other question. How many times did I have to backtrack when my um, guess was the first unassigned variable? 
backtrack. Now I had to backtrack a bunch of times. So I'm just throwing out the possibility here that maybe assigning the first unassigned variable in the list of all variables is an extremely poor heuristic. Um, it's only advantages that it's so easy to implement, but it might be that that kind of is a bad case and that just by switching to RNG, we've made progress on making a better heuristic. And if that's true, then maybe it's good enough because we just cut down by a large magnitude the number of backtracks it took to do a regular Sudoku. Let's make sure it still does thermo Sudoku um, correctly in the easy case. But here we go, three, four, five, six, seven. So yeah, that's allowed. So now it's giving me random solutions that follow the constraint of increasing along this line. One, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, eight. Two, four, six, seven, eight. All right, so that's cool. How many backtracks is it doing to solve this easy thermo? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85. Okay, I'm getting bored of counting this. This is more than I expected to find, but more than 100. What about if I didn't use random on this board? Boom. Backtrack one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ah, so this one was a lot cleaner with the get next available, and it was a lot worse with random, which is interesting, right? Why is random worse here? I wouldn't know. I don't know. But that does not make me as enthusiastic that if I switch to this, it'll just suddenly work. Probably it won't. Right. Not really any reason to think that it will suddenly work if it got worse with the easy thermo. The thermo constraint might, might just be something that needs a little bit more attention than what we've got given it so far. All right, enough with playing with that, hoping it might do something magic. Looks like no dice just from running. Oh, I'm still using, oh, hold on though. I'm still using the random or the non-random heuristic. Let's at least run the thing, right? Let's at least run the thing that we were saying we wanted to try. So what's funny about this is it's now way deeper in its guest chain. Like it used to hang out in the 20s and teens. Now it's, since it's ju just jumping all over the place, I think a part of what's interesting here is that with Sudoku in particular, false guesses don't constrain in very interesting ways. So if we were to only allow it to make true guesses, it might be a slightly better case use for the Sudoku case since false guesses basically say we're not putting a number in a certain spot, which isn't much of a guess. Right, it's guessing something very narrowly useful. It doesn't lead to a lot of deductions and stuff to make that kind of guess. But we could very easily tweak the heuristic to say, uh, where is it? Fat set, is it under four coder today? Yeah, there it is. Okay, so instead of guessing trues and falses, let's just have it always guess trues, but choosing the, which variable it picks randomly. 
see how that fares. Now it's not getting anywhere near as deep in its guest tree as it is, um, or in its guest stack as it is trying to figure out where to go. We're also getting more interesting backtracks that go back farther than one guess, right? So here it guessed 9, 10, and it backtracks to 8, which means it's learning that 288 or what is it learning? I don't know. It must be learning that x23 was in conflict with this, and so it backtracked to that point, but it couldn't connect it to these things or something like that. One other thing I want to take a look at, I don't think it can possibly be making any deductions up front in this problem. Is that right? Yeah. So it kind of makes some early guesses and never, ever, ever gets back to a point where it's undone that guess. But I think maybe the next big thing to think about is going to have to be how to make it learn better clauses. Because although we could do better heuristics, it also seems like one way or the other, it might need to do a lot of um, refinement on the problem in a case like this in order to get there. And its refinements are extremely weak right now. Like having learned clauses this wide is just not very good progress and must be slowing things down as more and more of these giant clauses become part of the game. There's something very interesting about the trend in the guess depth though. The fact that it never gets back to guess depth one in particular is fascinating to me. All right, so I do have an idea. I do have an idea. Ooh, look, it did get back to guess level one at one, part, one point. And again here. So it's making, it's making backtracks to zero here. Anytime it makes a backtrack to zero, that's real progress. Like that's pretty fundamental progress. But I wonder how many times it would have to do that. Cause that means it learned something about the problem that isn't dependent on a guess. Like that's really narrow.
Wow, okay. So there is something going on that I'm missing, which is that it makes progress in these spots here and really does start figuring out some parts of the board, but it's still getting stuck on other parts of the board. So maybe the other thing we need is we need to be able to visualize how much it understands as it's going in a better way. This log might not be doing us a good enough job of visualizing what it does and doesn't understand. So we didn't do variable priority today. I think we'll ha handle that next time. We didn't do thermo Sudoku specific heuristics. That's still coming down the line. But I think this would be a good spot for me to wrap up. Um, what we did get done is we got all of this stuff done for making watchers work. And we also threw in the random assignment guess heuristics. So that's cool progress. Um, uh, let's see. Um, there is one other thing I thought of trying that I'd like to give a shot at. Um, so that Sudoku board that I have uh, with the thermometers, that came from the Cracking the Cryptic YouTube channel. And if we go over here and we look through their videos, is there any way to like get a better grid layout? Right, can you guys like do something better than this or is it gonna be this big fat stupid list now? All right, um, Let's see if I can spot the Sudoku problem we were solving. I think this is the one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One. Yeah, yeah, this is the right one. So let's pop in here. Let's take a look. Okay, so if I was solving this, would I know, like what, 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 what would I do to make progress, I wonder? So what I would do is I would look for a spot where the constraints are Titus. I would look for the, the spot where the constraints really are going to add up the most. And there are two spots that I see like that. These and these. So if we look at these, these have to be large numbers. So like the largest they can be is a 9 and an 8 and a 7 and a 6, right? They can't be the same large numbers, but really there's not much constraint here because like this can go 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, eight, and there's no problem. So this, all we really know is that this has to be at least a three, this has to be at least a three, and they can't both be threes. So the one, two must go somewhere in here. And the same logic applies here, but now it's the low numbers need to go here instead of the high numbers. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe I should watch the uh, the way the cracking the cryptic 
folks solve it. See how see what deduction they make first, because that might be the one that's just like so hard to spot um, using brute force that that once you have it, a few numbers are on the board, and the rest of the constraints take you the rest of the way. Um, or there could be like a series of logical steps that need to be understood, and um, it could turn out that the right way to, to build the kind of solver I'm thinking of is to take the, the base layer that I've got, the, the C SAT solving, which fills in the gaps, and then put in a couple of key deductive steps that are possible based on insights from puzzles like these to speed it up, right? It's a possibility. Um, so I'm not gonna do that today, but it's a possibility of a way we could proceed. Actually, let me do one thing though. I'm gonna save this link from now on like this. I'm gonna say, let's put that right here. Just um, Sorry, didn't get the copy I thought I got. Puzzle source. So that way I can maybe try to research that and uh, possibly start start coming up with the uh, the deductive reasoning that I'm missing. We could also do that on regular some regular Sudoku rules at some point, but I'm not quite as convinced that that would make a huge difference since we found that regular Sudoku boards were just super easy. Um, let's see. While I'm at it, because I got a few minutes here, I want to play. So we've got. The random heuristic, which gives us new boards. Let's turn on King's move and Knight's move and have it generate boards a couple times just to amuse me. So if this is working, then there shouldn't be any place where two numbers are corner to corner are identical because that would violate King's move. And they shouldn't be a Knight's move away from each other either. So there's like a bubble now around every number is fairly large where no duplicates can occur. So like, here's this nine. There can't be nines in any of these spots because of Sudoku rules. There can't be nines in any of these spots because of King's move rules. There can't be nines in any of these spots because of Knight's move rules. So now there's this bubble. There's almost, but not quite a five by five around this nine. The only spot where nines can go inside that bubble are in the corners like that. Cool that it works. It's cool that it works. Um, neat. And every time it's going to give you. Oh, it's stuck this time. This doesn't happen very often, but maybe with random number of generation, it suddenly becomes a possibility, or maybe I screwed something up. I'm not sure. I didn't change anything. It ran once the first time. We just gotta wait for it to figure its way out. I wonder what's the difference between the first run and the second run that leads to the second run needing to work so much harder. At some point, does it get stuck into a specific, like it made some progress and then it gets stuck? Or this one doesn't have any deductions back to the base level here. Maybe it just had an unlucky initial set of guesses. And now it's clawing its way back out or something. Yeah, it's stuck this time. That's fascinating. I wonder what can account for the difference in whether it gets stuck or not. Yeah, 
it worked the first time and now it's it's getting stuck. I guess it just has to get lucky at the beginning sometimes. Which is a good argument for restarting. Oh, it did solve this one finally. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. I wonder how we could learn from that, like the difference between it going fast and and needing a minute. Um, if I turn off the logs, I wonder if it feels faster because logging can really slow a thing down. Yeah, now it's feeling instant a couple times. Here we go. Did it get stuck? Will it get there? This is interesting indeed. Makes me think that pre restarting must be valuable because you know sometimes it's just instant and sometimes it needs a moment. And so restarting like once a second to say like, hey, it looks like you, did, you didn't have any good guesses at this time, just go again, like there. And if, if the all options are, sometimes you get stuck for a minute and half the time you, you solve it instantly, then you don't run it and wait for a minute, you run it once a second until it finishes on its own, right? And it can still carry all of its learned clauses with it um, if it wants to. Cool, cool. All right, that's it for me today. So we um, we are making more progress on FatSat still. I guess if you are following along, the um, the thing that seems the big like the biggest next steps are probably learned clause simplification, which I need to go and study a little more, and maybe some low level up fixing. But then maybe some specific like user. Uh, user specified heuristics and a way to um, start building a better heuristic for this might be going on. So learned claw, uh, not learned clause removal, learned clause simplification, maybe learned clause removal because we do get a lot of those big fat clauses. Reset and phase saving could be coming up. So some options here, but there's all these different things that are um, still important for making the SAT solver fast enough. And uh, I think we need to spend more time on those. So stuff like this will be coming up next time. If you uh, are interested in this project or any of my projects, as always, make sure to go check out mrforth.com. You can find the link to the Discord where we uh, have threads that we talk about cool stuff. I recently put out this article. Um, this was from the research we started last Wednesday on stream. And so if you want to learn all the esoterica involved in dynamic linking on Windows or Linux through any of the standard compilers and linkers and stuff, uh, that's all right here in this ar reference article now. We've got um, like example code for how to do it directly, like what the decal specs are and uh, the APIs you use and uh, lots of explanations of how things work and also cool tricks like how to create hooks that automatically run when a binary loads before main begins, whether it's an exe or a DLL, you can actually get this variable to set x equals 100 before main runs. Um, and uh, details on that and examples of how to make like a, a base layer that is gonna work across dy uh, dynamic linking, uh, uh, which is what this is for. So lots of cool stuff here, I think. Make sure to check that out if any of that is interesting to you. Um, sign up for our newsletters from me so you can hear about projects as they're coming out. And uh, I'll see you guys around the internet. All right, bye bye.